has killed a bunch of humans, but he remembers all of their names, and he's kept all of their bodies preserved in a catacomb, and he visits them sometimes, so he's not really that bad. He's just creepy. I just want to let you know that I think that this is kind of a bad situation. I don't get it, but that's how the story starts. Hi everybody! Hey! So I, as you can see, I'm still back in California. Um, I, this is the only thing I have left to pack is my bed. Um, everything else is gone, that's why the background is blank. Something happened last night. I, this wound is fresh, guys. This is gonna be a wild ride of a video. Um, something happened exactly 12 hours ago and I need to talk to you about it. So this is going to be a little bit spoilery but I will give you those warnings ahead of time. You can stick around and figure out if you want to if you want to stay on board. So I always get books. I use Libby and Overdrive to borrow books from the library. Um, I always get my holds in in like a big rush. So I had I think three or four books that needed to be read in the next week and I'm packing and there's a lot of stuff going on. So I was like I'm gonna punch these books out like any chance I get. And so I had one book that came to me in the way that most books do which is i don't remember how i heard about it i don't remember anything about the plot what intrigued me what drew me to it to even place the hold in the first place it's a mystery the book was purely a mystery to me um but it very obviously was a fantasy potentially ya fantasy i don't i didn't i have no idea I'm, a, I'm an adult so i feel like i don't really need to check the ratings of books anymore so i knew it was a fantasy and it was short i checked i opened it and it said it was 234 pages and so to me I was like all right I can bust that out in a day a day and a half so I went to bed I cracked open the book at I'm gonna say let me check I picked up my book oh it doesn't tell me well I read for over four hours um so I picked up my book around 10 30 p.m and I didn't put it down until 1 40 a.m. And that's not to say it's because it was an incredible book. It wasn't a book that I was like completely drawn into, but it was a book that I felt like it's only 234 pages. If I stop somewhere in the middle, I'm not gonna pick it up. Like I feel like shorter books like that feel better when they're read in one go. Um, so I was just like, you know what? I'm gonna punch it out. I have nothing to do. My sleep is already wrecked. Let's just do it. But the reason why I know that this book was 234 pages is because around page 190, I'm reading it and I'm like, things are not going to wrap up in, you know, 40 pages um, the way that I would like them to. This is a weird way to write a standalone. Like, how are they going to wrap this up? And so I, on my iPad, <laughs> close Overdrive open chrome and i google the book and i see that it is these hollow vows number one as in it's in a series as in i was not reading a standalone when i 100 percent thought i was reading a standalone you guys know how i feel about starting series that are not finished i hate it because i forget the plot so whenever the next book in the series comes out i have to reread all of the previous books which is a pain in my butt um but also i'm very impatient and i like to have a story told to me all in one go that's all i want i want an ending and this did not give me that and I, it was 1 40 a.m and i was just sitting in my bed upset because i had read so late in the night and i if you guys ever pull late nighters all nighters late nighters you know when you've stayed up long enough that your dinner or your late night snack evaporates i hate that feeling and i was there so i'm just sitting in bed i'm hungry hyped up because it leaves you on a cliffhanger and i'm angry i was just sitting there so upset also oh wait i forgot to mention not only is this an unfinished series this book that i read came out July 2021. This is the freshest book. Like it was just picked from the book tree 
delivered to my home and I'm I read this on July 24th to give you guys this is weeks old this book is weeks old so I have to wait at least until July 2022 to read the next one and again I like things to be finished if I'm reading a series I'm gonna finish it even if I don't like it I'm not super distraught I know that I sound distraught but I'm not incredibly angry because I felt like I read this book before and so I'm gonna give you the non-spoiler summary um, and then we're gonna dive into specifics in case you guys have already read it or you don't feel like reading it once you hear this non-spoiler part whatever so let me tell you what these hollow vows is about oh and just um to clarify this is not ya fantasy because while i was looking up these hollow vows and i discovered that there is a series i also discovered that the author lexi ryan is a well-known romance writer i believe this is her first fantasy and i have been down that road before they ask you how you are and you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine so here is the non-spoiler look at what these hollow vows Entail. So the book starts with kind of this Cinderella story where we have Brie and her little sister Jazz and they kind of work essentially as indentured servants to their aunt and their two cousins who are basically like their evil stepsisters. The reason I say indentured servants is because they basically entered into this contract where they owe their aunt a debt but every time that they're late on their payment there's interest but then there's also penalties for being late etc. So they're basically resigned to the fact that they're going to be working with their aunt forever. And so in order to meet these payments, Brie has become kind of this master thief. And so that's really where we meet her is she is breaking into this nobleman's house. We learn that she knows an itty bitty bit of magic um, enough to kind of get herself around certain like security measures so that she can steal. And the reason that she's stealing today is because she has to pay these bills tomorrow. One thing leads to another and all of the stuff that she stole is no longer with her you will find out why um but she basically comes home empty-handed she tells her aunt like listen i don't have it today but i'm gonna have it tomorrow because tomorrow is the due date and, da, 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 da. and the aunt is like just go to the dungeon i don't want to hear you speak then we meet the little sister jess and she is super hyped because she has this grand plan to tell brie um apparently lucky for them the queen of the seely court aka the good ish fairies um is going to open the portal between the fairy and the human realms um and all of the eligible bachelorettes can go in and meet the prince the fairy prince and he needs a bride because fairies are kind of infertile and so it's safer to just have a human breeding source essentially is what it is and so jas is like brie we gotta go i'm gonna make you a dress we're gonna go to fairyland and everything's gonna be okay. That is when we learn that Brie hates fairies. She hates them with a burning passion. Why you ask? Because her mother, her and Jas's mother left them. Like the reason they're even with their aunt is because their mother fell in love with a fairy and was like, peace out girls, I'm gonna go live in fairyland. You stay with your aunt and just disappeared from their lives when Brie was like eight. So she is just like not down with the fairies. She really hates fairies. She says it many times. It's an important thing to remember. But Jazz is like, no, if we go to fairy, A, we can try and find mom. B, we can try and find a fairy that will like help pay our debts or like get us out of this jam, basically. She was like, we're not gonna pay off our debts the normal way. So we gotta go do it the fairy way. And let's go to this ball it's our only shot so while they're talking about their fairy plan their drop dead gorgeous neighbor boy named sebastian what's up i'm sebastian comes in and he gives his two cents which is basically i don't like fairies either i don't think you should go brie has the biggest crush on this boy like she likes to go outside while he is training with his sword and watch him sweat is <laughs> essentially what we learn from the very first page he is actually moving on to another apprenticeship he's a he's a apprentice to a mage so he has taught brie the little bit of magic that she knows actually which was nice of him but he is moving on to like another post so today is his last day so he was just popping in to be like hey 
bye that is as far as i can go without a spoiler um i will tell you that something occurs that she does have to go to fairyland and she's on a mission and um just to get things and there are secrets and curses and um creatures that want to kill her and there may or may not be two fairy princes that fall in love with her maybe <laughs> i feel a little bad calling it a aquatar ripoff because it's not ri uh, it's just got these certain elements like certain character things but to be fair all of those things have also occurred in books pre aquatar i just felt like i think i read it actually it said it was like for fans of aquatar and i was like well yeah i mean it yeah i'm just gonna say the two love interests give me hella aquatar vibes how about that that is exactly what it is i'm going to continue now into spoilery so if you don't want spoilers i will see you guys another time check back come back when you've read the 234 pages of the first book spoilers start now okay hey guys so while i left where did I leave you? So, Brie and Sebastian go out to have a little chat. Side note, she calls him Bash the whole time. B-A-C-H. It sounds like he's a Flintstone. Sebastian. It's not Sebastian. Anyway, I grew up with a guy named Sebastian in my school, all, all through school, elementary, middle, high school. We never chime in if any sebastians are watching let me know what you were called but um he goes by bash and i have a lot of questions about his name which i'll talk about in a second so while they're outside having their sweet little goodbye where they realize that ooh, sebastian might have actually had a crush on me this whole time brie your feelings weren't unrequited oh my gosh but now he's leaving is not so sad and then he's like please wait for me please don't go to fairy I'm gonna find a way to free you guys. You know, very dramatic goodbye. And while they're doing this, one of her cousins comes out and is like, ha ha, we just sold your sister into slavery. So it just, it doesn't really make sense because in the maximum one hour window between Brie coming home and telling her aunt that like, mm, don't really have enough money. And this is midnight by the way, and now, in between that time, her aunt calls someone up and they come and collect jazz. And she's literally, they use the word slavery. Like she has been sold. And she's basically like, yeah, these girls aren't gonna pay their debt, so I'm just gonna sell her. Why wouldn't you sell both of them? Why are you only selling jazz? So Brie is free. Brie has lost her sister, but she has gained complete freedom. All of her debts are forgiven. I don't. I don't get it, but that's how the story starts. <laughs> so she befriends her aunt's house goblin because goblins are the only creatures that can go back and forth between the two realms. And so she asks him um, many questions regarding her sister so that she can go hunt her down. Goblins in this world are collectors of hair. So anytime she asks a question, she has to give him a lock of her hair. He really likes it because, specifically hers, because she has beautiful red hair because she's the protagonist of a fantasy novel. So the goblin tells us that Jazz has not just been sold into any old job, she has been sold to the king of the unseelie court, aka the bad fairy court. Brie is immediately like, okay, we're gonna go get her. I'm gonna go get my money. I'm gonna go get my girl. Meanwhile, the goblin is standing there and he's like, I think this might be a trap. Just going out on a limb here. I think the fairies might be tricking you. I just wanna let you know that I think that this is kind of a bad situation. She doesn't get the hint, even though he says it in every way possible that like, by the way, this is a trap. She's only got eyes for her sister at this point. She ties up a couple loose ends, says goodbye to Sebastian. Sebastian is like, wait, I'm gonna give you this crystal that's an, a protection amulet and you can wear it when you're in fairy and I'll protect you. She's like, goodbye, they have a little kiss. 
all of a sudden it's like, wait, we were in love this whole time. Oh, what a waste of two years. And she goes off to the Seelie Court, which is the Good Fairies, which is where they're having this ball so that they can find Prince Ronan, a human baby maker. The only reason she's going to the ball is that so she can get into the court and the queen apparently has some kind of portal that brings her to the Unseelie Court. Like there's no good way to get to the Unseelie Court so you need a little magic portal. She's gonna go like scoop around, scoop, snoop, scope around the palace and find her way there. And pretty much the second that she gets there, um, she runs into this really beautiful man who has silver eyes, which we have heard before in this book that the bad ones have silver eyes. But she also doesn't seem that scared. Like for the amount that she is like, fairies are so bad, fairies are so scary, I don't want to see fairies, I don't want to be near them, especially not ones with silver eyes. She runs into a fairy with silver eyes and she's just like, who are you? She's so rude. She ends up finding her portal, goes to the Unseelie court, and it's a trap. It's a trap. <laughs> Basically, the king needs a bunch of things from the palace. Like, I guess the other queen stole a lot of stuff from him, and he's like, I want that stuff back, and I don't want to get it myself, so I need you to get it. And if you get it, I'll release your sister and all will be fine. And so she, you know, does her due diligence. She makes her request really specific. She knows the fairy trickster thing. She comes to this agreement and essentially she has to go back to the ball, charm her way into like the top 12 women that the prince will choose so that she can live in the palace while he like speed dates to find out who he wants to marry. And while he's doing that, she she can snoop around and grab the objects for the king. So she heads back to the Seelie court and right before she goes inside, the kind of silver eyed man captures her or something, whatever happens, he and a bunch of his friends are working together and they kind of capture her and they're like, listen, we know that you're trying to help the bad king, but we are kind of the middle people because all government is bad. And so we want to help you. We're on your side, but like blah, 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 whatever. She doesn't care about anyone but getting her sister freed, which is fine. Um, so she's basically like, fuck off, leave me alone. I need to go fake woo this prince, get all of this crap for the king, and then we're piecing out of fairyland. Like, I don't want to be here for any longer than I need to be. Let me do my job. So she runs off into the woods, almost gets eaten by this weird, questionable object that they call the death dog. Who shows up to save her? Bash. And she's like, what the hell? Sebastian. If you read the book, it could not have been more obvious. He is Prince Ronan, which is never explained, by the way, why he prefers to go by Sebastian. He's like, no, I want you to call me Sebastian. Only my mother and my subjects call me Ronan, which now that I'm thinking about it is literally everyone. He's the prince. So the queen and his subjects is everyone in the country, right? So who? What? Okay, well that doesn't make sense, but anyway, he's like basically only a few people call me Ronan. You can still call me Sebastian, it's fine. She realizes that he has been lying to her for two years. It was very obvious that he was the prince, like very obvious. So she's really upset and she runs away, but she's also like, but I need you, I need to woo you. God, it's just so stupid. So anyway, he's already in love with her and he's already like, I wanna marry you right now, so why don't we just cut the crap? And she's like, no, no, <laughs> no, no, I'm angry at you because you lied to me, even though she's betraying him and lying. So I need more time to think. So why don't you invite like all the other girls and do your speed dating thing and I'll stay here and you can like speed date me, even though we all know that I'm your number one choice and um, I can steal stuff from you and your mom. <laughs> so while the speed dating is happening, all of the girls have tutors where they can learn all of the things they need to learn to be the future queen because one of them will be. When Brie goes to meet her tutor, she realizes that she has actually been 
duped again by her silver-eyed person who is named Finn, aka Finnegan, aka the nephew of the bad king who it's his rightful throne. So we have two princes that we're dealing with here. How much do you want to bet that both of them fall in love with her? How much do you want to bet that she falls in love with both of them? So anyway, he and his friends kind of recapture her under the guise of being her tutor. They explain to her that she has a hell of a lot of powers and she's actually like kind of a super human. She's not a fairy, but she's like got all these weird fairy powers, which doesn't make any sense. And so you need to train. You're so powerful. You can help us overthrow the bad king because all we want to do is get on the throne and be good people, right? Like everybody says. So this is where it really, really starts to feel like Akutar, just because we have the first love interest who is really, really loving, but he's also controlling and suffocating and he has a lot of secrets and there's this curse that nobody can talk about. There's all these like questionable things happening. Like he basically has refugee camps, but like internment camps. And he's like, well, there's no other way. They're overwhelming the resources for my country. So like I'm protecting my people. So I have to like separate the children from their parents and put them in cages, basically. So he's got that going on. Um, very controlling, very much like, I just want you to be happy and quiet and I'm gonna build you a library where you just don't have to worry about anything and you can read. And then we have the other interest, Finn, who is like, I never want you to bond with anyone. You need to be free. You are so powerful. You need to like choose choices. Anyway, it progresses, and this is where I realized that Lexi Ryan writes romances. It wasn't that bad, but there was definitely a scene where I would pay money. Honestly, Cindy, if you're watching this, open an OnlyFans. I will pay you so much money. I don't know if you can do videos on OnlyFans. I desperately need you to read and react to this one particular scene because there is a moment where she is at a ball and she drinks a little too much fairy wine, starts doing some stuff she normally doesn't do, starts saying stuff she normally doesn't say. She gets taken to Finn's compound to be safe. Nothing happens. She's burning up. She's got an incredible fever. And apparently it's so bad that she's like potentially gonna die, so they need to cool her down. The only thing they can do is Finn has to go into the cold shower and like hold her there. That's all I can say. The thing is, I enjoyed... Did I enjoy Finn's character? I don't know. I don't think I really liked any character at all. I think that Finn had moments where I liked him. Anyway, we go through our little like, I love Sebastian, but I think I love Finn, but how... But, 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 but. Like, you know, we go through that whole thing. She ends up stealing all of the objects that are needed. And then there's supposed to be this big twist. It was absolutely not a twist just as like from the first time that sebastian opened his mouth you knew that he was prince ronan everything else fell into place like we knew that finn was the bad prince right but you also knew something was up with sebastian sebastian had to be also kind of bad turns out weirdly he's mixed he's sealy and unsealy court he's good court and bad court which will come into play in a second. And also, turns out the bad fairies aren't really bad. The fairies are just cursed. And the only way that they can survive is if they kill a bunch of humans. So it makes them seem bad because they're killing a bunch of humans. But they're only doing that because they need to survive. The good queen is the one who put the curse on them because the good queen was in love with the king. But then the king went to the human world and he met Bree's mother and fell in love. But then he had to come back to Fairyland, and by the time that he came back, she had already met a human man and had two kids, Bree and Jas, but he still loved them, and so when they had a house fire, he saved them, and he gave up his life in order to save Bree, and that's why she has his powers, and that's why she is the rightful ruler of the Unseelie Court. All of this was figured out many pages ahead of time like many pages but that's okay and so even knowing this so she we kind of end the book at this point where sebastian has been bugging her to bond with him for forever and this is like this unbreakable fairy bond where 
um, you can like sense each other like if you're in danger or whatever like I can feel it and blah 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 you know and she's like no you know I need my freedom and Finn has always been like do not bond with Sebastian do not bond with the bad king they're gonna ask you a million times don't do it girl and she's like I'm not gonna do it I'm not gonna do it I'm just thinking about it I'm not gonna do it and then she does it the last scene I can't tell you why like I have literally no understanding of why she decides to do this she just bonds with sebastian randomly even though she's like super in love with finn but she's also anyway she does the bonding thing and we have just learned from the bad king that if a human bonds with a good fairy it's gonna be okay 99 percent of the time it's fine if a human bonds with a bad fairy they die what Sebastian has always been asking her to do is to marry him, to bond with him, and then once they pop out a couple kids, they're gonna give her this potion of life which will change her into a fairy. Um, and they're, you know, they're doing that later because she needs to produce children first, right? She bonds with him, has this horrible reaction. She's dying because Sebastian's bad. And luckily, because he knew he was bad, he has the potion on hand and transforms her into a fairy which you know what she's immortal she has a crush on two immortal guys so it's probably better for her in the long run to be immortal but with the bond you can share each other's magic and as we learned from finn he keeps telling brie like you're super powerful you have the power passed down from the king so now sebastian bash can access her power as well as his. And he is the rightful ruler of the Seelie Court. She is the rightful ruler of the Unseelie Court. So now he's just gonna be the ruler of all of Fairyland. I don't even know if it was before, during, or after that she realizes that Sebastian has been playing her this whole time because he knew, like he knew who she was. He knew her background. He knew about his, like his mom, hating Bree's human mom who stole her fairy king husband from her you know like he knew all this and he's been playing her and the goblin fucking told her finn i just don't like the ending was so what did you do like why did you do this what did you do she also gets her sister safely out of fairyland brings her back to the human world and is like i've got to go back for Sebastian. Like what? Why? None of none of this made sense. I was so angry. And also, I just want to say, Finn has two wolf friends that protect him and protect Bree and they're super loyal and they're super great. Even though Finn clearly has like bad fairy tendencies, like in order to live, he has killed a bunch of humans, but he remembers all of their names and he's kept all of their bodies preserved in a catacomb and he visits them sometimes. So he's not really that bad. He's just creepy. But anyway, he has his two little dog friends and I feel like that's a good sign because Sebastian has never mentioned dogs. Even if you aren't able to have a dog, like you're a prince, you're busy, you're traveling. I understand not being able to own a dog, but to never talk about dogs, to never mention a dog, I immediately had bad vibes. So Sebastian just like does not pass the dog vibe test. I feel like he's he's basically just a little Tamlin. We, we didn't need two books. We only needed one book for him to do the full Tamlin 180 kind of thing. Anyway, that was these hollow vows. I enjoy like I didn't mind it like I I enjoyed it because it had all the elements that I liked even though I hate how often she had to say I never want to marry a prince I, you know I want to be free I don't want to be a princess but oh no two princes fell in love with me what do I do I don't love that trope but I'll read about it you know it's fantasy what are you gonna do it was fine you know what it was it was fine. If you were in a reading rut and you just really like reading fantasy, you love reading things that take place in fairy realms, royal courts, all that stuff, it was not painful to read. The Shadows Between Us was painful to read. Hilarious, hilarious, but painful. This one was not. This one was just like, I wanted to jump in and like shake all of these characters and just be like, pah, pah. it wasn't super bad. It was just 
so frustrating, especially when I was hungry and it was like 2 a.m. It was just rough. So I just wanted to tell you this while it was still fresh. I don't know how, if you can see how red I've gotten. It's very hot in my room, but I'm also heated inside. Like I was just so, I was just so mad. But anyway, anyway, I haven't heard people talk about it yet because I feel like it did just come out and maybe that should have been like a red flag for me. But like I said, it's got the elements, like if you're into that, read it. It wasn't bad. Um, just don't read it in one shot expecting it to be a standalone and then realizing that it wasn't at 2 a.m. when you're already jet lagged and you're stressed. Anyway, add this to the list of our redheaded protagonists that don't want to be princesses but they accidentally, you know, have princes fighting over them and they have to save fairyland. A strangely long list, actually. <laughs> anyway, I'm gonna leave you here. I'm hot. My voice is going. Thank you for being on that journey with me. Um, let me know if you guys have read it, what you guys thought about it. Again, it wasn't bad, it wasn't good. Shadows would... We're not gonna go into it, we're not gonna talk about it. Anyway, um, yeah, I'll leave you here and I will talk to you guys later. I do promise, so I'm... I'm posting this one now because I'm like still raging, clearly, but I am working on another one that I promised you about a certain duology that I read recently that also gave me a lot of feels but much better feels. There wasn't frustration, there was just a lot of like heaving sobs at the end. So if you want some of that, that's coming your way very soon. Um, but yeah, I've got to stop now. I've got to go like drink some ice water or something <laughs> and I will see you guys next time. Okay, bye. <clears throat> hey, what's up? I'm Sebastian. Okay, now show me the strut.